<laughs> well, so fax check. He'll fax. What is it? Fact check everything I say. Now I can't. I have to be accurate. Well, thank you. I want to thank Villanova and everybody and Richard. Thank you very much. So uh, doing DNA these days is a big popular thing to do. And so I did a DNA test on American popular music. It came back 90% Napolodon <laughs> and about 10% Philadelphian. <laughs> so tonight we're going to look at how Italian artists, Italian-American artists, uh, continually surface as significant forces in American pop music, pop culture, and uh, how many came out of Philadelphia. And Philadelphia itself and many other levels uh, contributed in many fields to what we call American pop music. So why Napolitano? Well, because of this guy, the first American pop star, Enrico Caruso. He was born in Naples. He was a uh, opera star in Italy for many years. Came to the USA in 1903. Why Philly? Because in 1904, he signed with the Victor Talking Machine Company out of Camden, New Jersey, and together they made history in American music. They really did. So we're going to look at all of this, hopefully within an hour. It's a huge, huge topic. But you can't really talk about pop music without talking about the medium, how you get to hear it. And if you think about it, throughout history, there was no recording of anything until Edison invented the, this wax cylinder system where you could get sound and listen to it back, which is pretty incredible and portable sound concept. And um, that's what it looked like. <clears throat> but it was pretty rough. I mean, the quality of the recording was not very good. And it wasn't really uh, used by musicians. It was only two minutes long was the maximum. And uh, it was more or less, you'd get vaudevillians doing uh, little routines or some jokes and things of that nature, something like this. So that was about it. That's what you got. So <laughs> musicians really didn't like it at all. And the leading musician of the day was John Philip Sousa, his marching band. And he absolutely despised the whole idea of trying to record onto these terrible things. I'm going to read you a quick quote. There was a congressional hearing in 1906, which was uh, about patents already on the subject. And he, he was, uh, testimony said, these talking machines are going to ruin the artistic development of music in this country. When I was a boy, you'd sing every popular song of the day. Today, you hear these infernal machines incessantly going night and day. The vocal cord will be eliminated by process of evolution, like the tale of man when he came from the ape. <laughs> Pretty rough, but it gives you an idea of what they thought of this. And it was tough on the musicians. Well, this is Sousa. His company signed a contract to record the band on Victor. He refused to conduct. None of the recordings were conducted by Sousa. He wanted nothing to do with it. That's a, that's a fact. This is what you had to do. You know, cram yourselves around, and you can see on the sides as well. Uh, you know, cram in front of this horn. You can see the violins up front, the poor bass player on this little rack there to get the bass sound, and try to get into that. And the, the, the singers had to actually put their face inside the horn and hope they didn't sing too loudly or it would start all over again, really a mess. And, and beyond that was the medium itself was a wax cylinder and this is actually what it wouldn't look like. This would be one two minute song on here. And Sousa called it canned music. So if nothing else you learned that where that came from tonight. I'll show you this. So that's the cylinder. You'd pop it in that little machine and get two minutes of something, whatever it may be. So Victor was determined to eradicate that, that bad reputation and, and do something bold and musical. So where do they turn? This big star at the Met, 90 miles away, the Metropolitan uh, Opera House. And they signed in 1904 Enrico Caruso. And as you can see, Caruso immortalized. This little ad talks about throughout history, we had art and literature passed down, but never a human singing voice or musical performance, if you think about it. And this was 
immortalizing Caruso and grand opera at home. So this changed, as they say, everything, everywhere, all at once. They made a movie about him called that. <laughs> it really did. I mean, imagine now, first of all, the, uh, the process itself uh, was really good to a tenor voice. It, the, the tenor voice range worked well on those cylinders. Secondly, his instrument, his voice was, what could you say about Caruso? They claim when Puccini auditioned him for one of his operas and he came in, he sang, and Puccini said to him, who sent you, God? <laughs> so he was quite unique. He also influenced the medium because Victor at the time was uh, working with Emil Berlinger who invented the flat disc, the 78 disc, and it was going to be a big investment to switch over and Caruso insisted they do so. You know, it, he heard that they only could make 120 of these a day and his Neapolitan ego said, there's no way that's going to be enough. <laughs> we have to go to these records. Plus he couldn't envision his mom with the kids having hundreds of these all around the house. You know, that wouldn't have worked. So anyway, this is all evolving. Uh, Victor had studios in Philadelphia at the time, uh, right across the river. They opened this up in 1901 at 10th and Lombard. There's not much documentation, but this is where Caruso went to record. Uh, there is a clip from a, uh, a memoir from the engineer, and it quote, upon entering our new quarters at 424 South 10th Street, 10th and Lombard, we were furnished with considerable excitement and quite a stir in the neighborhood outside with the people enthralled, enthralled with the thought of us making records. And what records they made were just amazing. The high quality of Caruso's voice, the new uh, sound of the, the 78 disc uh, made it really a social sea change. Even the election uh, a few years later, 1912, the presidential candidates, Woodrow Wilson, it was a three-way race with Taft, Wilson, and Teddy Roosevelt. They took advantage and started recording speeches and giving them out at rallies. So the first CNN there. <laughs> um, here's Woodrow Wilson. So you had these speeches, they would go to rallies and hand them out and people would take it home and spread the word. Quite interesting. But then to get to the end of this little phrase, in 1916, total revolution with uh, a little better quality recording and the recording of O Sole Mio, one-sided 78. This is it if you want to look at it later. Victor Talking Machine Company, Rico Caruso, the first million selling record in the history of the United States, probably of the world. And we'll give one. You get the idea. And I, I should say, you have to take a look at that picture, right? The opera stars of the day would pose in costume on stage. What's he doing? He's a good businessman. He's right in front of that Vitrola saying, you gotta buy one of these. <laughs> take me home with you. There was an article in the National Music Monthly in 1917. Now this is recorded in 1916, what you just heard. And the Music Monthly in 1917 said, why has this great interest and enthusiasm for opera and music so suddenly developed? Two words, Caruso and the phonograph. So there you have a little insight into the introduction. Now a big shift happened in 1920. Another Philadelphian, Atwater Kent, invented the home radio. I mean, again, up until now, no radio. And uh, RCA, Radio Corporation of America, created radio. RCA, of course, eventually Bought Victor, hence RCA Victor. But um, the radio presented a big problem for uh, all the recording companies because it sounded better. They were using a new Western Electric microphone uh, for the live broadcast. It sounded more natural and a better sound. It was free coming into your home on the radio. So Victor had a switch now, a huge investment. It was like two years of profits to go to electronic uh, microphone. It was one simple mic with an engineer like that. But now you can see the orchestra could sit kind of normally, uh, going just into that one mic right there. 
and it became fully operational in 1925. Again, Philadelphia, the Philadelphia Orchestra was the first symphony orchestra ever recorded with electronic microphone. And soon after that, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue was a big hit. You can hear the violin now. It's 1926, I believe, so pretty incredible. So <clears throat> this was kind of the last component to bring on, I'm finally getting there, American pop music, because it was groundbreaking in that you could perform entirely more naturally now, instrumentally and certainly vocally. You didn't have to have Caruso's voice or Al Jolson's belting it out type of style. It captured uh, every instrument beautifully, uh, you're at the cusp of the jazz age, so you had bands coming into play that were new. You still had the euphoria of the, uh, uh, the post-World War I era. And, as Richard would tell you, 1925, the peak of Italian immigration, 40 years of mass migration. And it was basically a perfect storm for Italian influence. You had Italians settled in. In America, having a social, economic, and musical uh, input. And who better than Italians with their natural background, right? The verismo is a word they use in opera, a realistic style of singing and performing, their history, their pedigree of, 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 of talent, and their cockiness, their casualness. All these traits were natural to them and now being able to be captured in the new era of what was going to become modern music. Okay, we only have a hundred more years to go now, so. <laughs> Richard's getting sandwiches, they're coming in at midnight. So now we're at the real start of the uh, American pop music, and we're gonna look at it through two Philadelphia area Italian Americans, just as an example. Uh, you can't focus on everyone, obviously, in one, uh, one hour. So I chose Eddie Lang from South Philly, Salvatore Massaro, his real name, and Ross Colombo from Camden. Uh, these were two giants that we're going to talk about and just see what they did and how they kind of represent a lot of the Italian-American uh, vibe. So uh, everybody wanted in now on the, on the music scene, you know, and jazz was captivating Americans. Uh, Dixieland, of course, was the big thing, but a lot of the black bands in New Orleans couldn't get recorded except for maybe Louis Armstrong. But don't forget, there were a quarter of a million Sicilians in New Orleans. They called it Little Palermo, actually. And so they're interacting, they're getting this jazz influence. They had the talent and ability uh, of all the instruments and it kind of melded together into something new. Uh, Louis Prima was 15 years old at this time as a phenom playing trumpet, a Sicilian down, down there in New Orleans. And of course, million more, millions more Italian uh, musicians in New York, Philly, et cetera. I mean, don't forget America was a hundred million people and. 20, a quarter of them lived in New York, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, like 25 million. So it was natural. And of that, a big Italian uh, community. So it's not coincidence that this region produced so much. But the, the hot bands were adding strings and singers to the Dixieland. Therefore, Italians, again, were, were the perfect people. Paul Whiteman was um, the biggest star at the time with his orchestra. And all the side men in these bands, many, many Italian Americans. Now, Paul Whiteman was a real businessman who wanted always the best. And he's the one that heard about Eddie Lang and Joe Venuti, violin and guitar, jazz players in South Philly. They grew up at 7th and Fitzwater. And um, he discovered them. They had already been making records and having influence. But by being in his band, now they had much bigger platform. So uh, he hired both of them. And with that exposure, Eddie Lang is really, again, Salvatore Massaro, uh, really considered the father of the jazz guitar. Now at this time was also, there's Joe Venuti and Eddie Lang. And the White Man Band, there's Eddie Lang right up front there. So talking pictures were the big thing and uh, sure enough, Universal wanted to top the jazz singer and produce their own musical. They hired Paul Whiteman to bring the entire band from the East Coast out to Hollywood to make a movie. 
uh, with terrible results, not musically or movie wise, but socially. <laughs> they, I mean, imagine you had 25, 30, 20 or something kids in the band, suddenly famous, money. Uh, Ford Motor Company bought 30, gave Whiteman 30 Model A cars, <laughs> one for each musician in California. I don't know how many made it back in one piece, probably. <laughs> There's some really scary stories. And anyway, um, so it was a pretty wild bunch out there making this film. And uh, there was this article about him being the daddy of all these bad boys on these trips. So the rowdiest of them all were the three singers. They were known as the Rhythm Boys. And the lead singer of that little trio was a guy named Bing Crosby. And uh, Eddie Lang was very close to Bing because of his playing. He backed him up on everything. And Paul Whiteman, because Eddie was very reserved, he kind of told him, you keep an eye out on Crosby, please. You know, he would miss gigs and things because he was drinking and so forth. So he didn't do a good job of reining in Bing, but he did do a great job of accompanying him to the point where it really became monumental, that relationship and the impact that he had on style of singing. In fact, uh, Gary Giddens, who's written many uh, jazz history books, especially on Bing Crosby, uh, I have a quick quote here. On nearly all of his recordings, Bing was backed by Eddie Lang, sitting at his right elbow, sharing a mic, steadying him with strumming chords and arpeggios. He called Eddie Lang Bing's jazz conscience. And he also said, even as a person, he took responsibility for Bing as a singer, as a front man, uh, for the music that they loved. So it was quite a, quite a special relationship that they had. So Eddie Lang, another great band at the time, others uh, in Crosby and Eddie Lang with that famous microphone right there. Another famous band, again, you probably haven't heard of, because this is way before the big band era of the Glenn Millers and so forth. Um, Gus Arnheim, also out of Philly, um, he took notice of a 20-year-old violin player who was born in Camden, and he also liked his singing. And uh, that's Russ Colombo on the violin there. He needed a backup singer because this is now 1930, and his singer was missing gigs because he was drinking too much. So he needed a backup. Guess who his singer was? Yep. Bing was now with that band. <laughs> so anyway, sure enough... Crosby got kicked out of that group, and Columbo became the, the uh, heartthrob lead singer of that band. And he really flourished as a soloist. And none of us really know this, our age or, or younger, certainly, because of his short career. But he really flourished. And um, in 1931, he wrote Prisoner of Love, a great song, became a big hit. And a recent article I saw said he had a natural soothing sincerity in his voice, may be rooted in his Italian heritage. This was an article, an unbiased article. <laughs> may be rooted in his Italian heritage that connected with Depression-era listeners. Again, the same thing we keep saying, this, this special realism in their voice. So they rose together, and uh, he became quite a star. He was in a big romance with Carol Lombard, the famous actress. As she had to settle for Clark Gable a few years later. But <laughs> uh, His big hit was, oh, they, uh, it was called... You call it madness, but I call it love. Now, the press loved battling uh, Crosby and Columbo as though they hated each other, which didn't exist. They were friends in that band. They stayed friends. Bing actually helped write that song, but they called it the Battle of the Baritones. And they mocked this by, they said, you call it Crosby, but I call it Russ. That was what the press would say about, about that song. But um, again, this style of singing was very new. There was one other guy, um, Rudy Valley, some of you have heard of, who was considered a crooner. That's the term they came up with at the time. But he was very different. He still sang with the megaphone, a higher pitched voice. But nonetheless, they clumped them all together as crooners, and they would make fun of them as this new fad. And um, the, the Cardinal from Boston said it was bass defiling and un-American music. <laughs> because you went from this, you went from Al Jolson, Balding Al Jolson singing to his mom. Okay, to this, the singing Valentino, right? Mm -hmm. Right? 
So you could see the difference and hear the difference. But this was the image of the crooner. You know, the woman in his arms, the drink in his hand, etc. So it was frowned upon by some people. But whatever you thought of it, you can't deny. I mean, the jazz playing, the singing style that Eddie Lang and, and Russ Columbo brought was very different. And with raw emotion that they say, kind of a trademark of the temperament we think of with Italian in the old country. So um, I just want to say that um, if these guys were so iconic, why don't we know them, right? I mean, obviously, Eddie Lang and Russ Colombo are not household names. Well, because they, um, they had similar tragic lives, unfortunately. Um, Eddie Lang, that's a mural that exists in South Philly of Eddie. You can see Bing Crosby over one shoulder, Joe Venuti over the other. Um, in March of 1933, uh, he had a lot of sore throats, and he was always sick, and Bing Crosby encouraged him to have a tonsillectomy. He finally talked him into it, and in those days, I guess anything can go wrong, and it, it did, and he didn't survive the operation. <clears throat> that was March 1933. Eighteen months later, September of 34, Ross Colombo was on his way to have dinner with Carol Lombard and stopped at his friend's house who had a, a Civil War gun collection. And he was showing them they were smoking and a spark hit it and it went off and killed them. So they were really two stunning losses. Eddie Lang was 31. Russ Colombo was 26. And there's the Russ Colombo headline. Comment about Carol Lombard. They were probably going to get married. Um, and Bing was a pallbearer at both, at both funerals. This is at Russ Colombo's funeral in California. He was also a pallbearer as uh, Lenny has documented, at St. Rita's in South Philly for Eddie Lang. It said that, that like, Crosby took this so hard that he never got another close friend. He was remained aloof. And uh, their wives were even very close, and his wife went to live with them, Eddie's widow, after, after this. Uh, there's a marker for Eddie Lang in South Philly, father of the jazz guitar. It mentions everything we've mentioned here, soloist, groundbreaking, there's one for Joe Venuti as well. We didn't get too much into Joe. So Eddie Lang and Russ. So I'm going to give you a uh, three, it's just a three minute video to kind of capsulize some of the things I mentioned for this portion. Uh, you're going to see Eddie Lang and Joe Venuti in this King of Jazz film, which they got off the ground despite the antics of the band. And you'll hear them and see the kind of ability they had. 1929 was filmed. You'll also see Eddie in films a couple years later backing up Crosby, and even Ruth Edding, who was monumental. I never knew that he worked with her. Uh, then you'll see Russ Colombo as a young violinist in this Gus Arnheim band. But even that, you'll see his presence when he's up there. It's very different. Then you'll see him as his leading man. And also, as part of the ridicule of the crooners, there was a song they put out called Crosby, Colombo, and Valley. It's like a making a mockery of these guys for being you know, womenizers and so forth. So let's give this a, a quick look.
That's like the Saturday Night Live of the day, I guess, making fun of pop culture. So uh, he's cruising vagabonds or stealing all our blondes. Pretty, pretty racy language there. All righty. Well, anyway, so we're halfway through, and I haven't used the F word yet. I'm sorry. I'll get to Frank now, though. <laughs> because now we're getting into the big band era, which I can't possibly expound upon. That would be another whole week. <laughs> so... But just be it said that the uh, 30s and 40s was obviously the big band era. And again, Italian-American musicians, sidemen in every band. And you had some band leaders. Tony Pastor was Italian. Louis Prima, sidemen like uh, Buddy DeFranco, Louis Belson, Frankie Carl, Vito Musso, Charlie Ventura. It goes on and on with the great, great Italian-American musicians that were part of the big band era. And songwriters like Harry Warren, whose real name was Salvatore Guaragna. And uh, Harry Warren wrote At Last for Glenn Miller, later covered by Etta James. He wrote Chattanooga Choo Choo for, for Glenn Miller. So uh, yeah, he competed only, he was only outnumbered by Berlin for a number of hit records as a composer. In fact, when they bombed Germany during the war, he said they bombed the wrong Berlin. <laughs> they, they, they had like a funny feud going on, but they were really the tops. Uh, vocalists, now the vocalists were secondary to musicians, clearly, at the time. But you had them, obviously. And again, Italian-Americans, Johnny Desmond, Sergeant Johnny Desmond in the Glenn Miller Air Force Band, Johnny De Simone, his real name. And, of course, Frank uh, with the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. From 1940 to 43, Dorsey and Sinatra had 23 top 10 singles in a couple years. The Dorsey's Pennsylvanians, by the way, up near Pottsville, so Tommy and Jimmy Dorsey, the second most famous family next to Yingling from Pottsville. <laughs> but again, we're not going to get into the big band era, but let's look at it, how it leads to the golden age of the vocalists and the Italian-American vocalists in particular. Uh, you know, toward the, as the war wore on, it was more and more difficult to keep the big bands going uh, because, you know, they, they were all fighting age guys in the bands. They had to go overseas. Gasoline rationing, they couldn't tour. People couldn't go out to the ballrooms. They were off and out of town. And then there was the 1942 musician strike, uh, led by a famous or infamous Italian, uh, James Petrillo. Um, there was a big dispute over royalties. It kind of has never been resolved to this day uh, with musicians and royalties on recordings. And uh, he called the strike. So whether it was well-grounded or not, it nonetheless backfired. It really helped kill the rest of what was left of the big band era. And uh, Petrillo was a household name, by the way, because people followed the bands like they were ball players. They knew, oh, the sax player from Glenn Miller went over to Benny Goodman and like trading in teams. So consider him like the NFL commissioner or something like that. He was known by people. And um, it was quite a debacle. So record labels had to scramble to uh, release old things that they found. Harry James came out great because he found a 1939 recording Sinatra had done of All or Nothing at All. <laughs> it had never been released. Now by 1942, Frank was with Dorsey, but uh, he had a big hit with Harry James after the fact. But the singers were not part of the musicians' union. Or as we like to say, what do you call a singer? Somebody who hangs out with musicians. I'm sorry, guys. but. 
So they were not part of the union, so they were not subject to the strike. So they continued to record, and they would use backup singers as like a vocal cushion. I'm sure you've heard those kind of things. And um, so between all of that, as the war ended, tastes were changing. Uh, the strike and everything else that happened really gave way to the solo singer now. Of course, Frank Sinatra, Perry Como. 44, Sinatra went solo. Perry Como came along. He was not well known as a big band singer. He was with Ted Weems, a guy who went to West, West Philadelphia High School. Um, and the band was okay. It was popular, but not to the extent that Frank was. But as a soloist, Perry Como really soared. And there's a, a, a note from a music journal. There was one clear winner to come out of the musician strike, Perry Como. Now, he wasn't from Philly, but he was from the Aperitsay's Enclave in Cannonsburg, PA, out near Pittsburgh, where my grandfather, my sister's here. Our grandpa grew up, he went there from Italy. He claims to have known the Tavellini family, which was Perry Como's mother's side. Now, I don't know if it's true. <laughs> Probably did. And that's 10 minutes over the Ohio border to Steubenville, where Dean Martin is from, all right, just to give you a little... So we could claim everybody as Philly. <laughs> What's a couple hundred miles? Steubenville had a huge Italian population. Dean Martin didn't even speak English till he went to elementary school. Never had an accent, but it was indiscernible, but that's a fact. So Sinatra and Como were very, very different in style. But again, you keep reading. If you, I did a lot of checking because I knew um, Richard would check anything I said that wasn't true. So I did a lot of Googling before tonight to make sure the stories I've heard over the years were true, and I got rid of some. <laughs> but I, I found an article talking about their different style, but they both conveyed, quote, an honest, comfortable vibe, something the public was yearning for after years of war. So again, this kind of running theme. So here we have it again, confluence of forces, right? A new age of singing uh, and music in general. And it really kicked off the golden age of the Italian-American singer. You had... 20 years, really, from the end of World War II up until 1964, uh, when Italian-Americans just dominated the charts. It's pretty incredible. In 1946, let's say as an example, six top 20 Billboard records, just Perry Como and Frank Sinatra. This was 21 weeks, number one. Perry Como covered Prisoner of Love, the song that we talked about earlier that Russ Colombo wrote. And uh, the, actually, the one, two, and three were, number two was, this is for that year, 46, Frank. And number three, an instrumental, Frankie Carl, Frankie Carlone. He was very well-known piano player. They had the three top hits. In 47, Perry Como had three more number ones. This began kind of a little downturn for Sinatra, but others stepped up. Frankie Lane, Vic Damone. In 40, 1949, Vic Damone, Frankie Lane, Perry Como had number two, three, four. 1950, the Philly guys started to be more present and actually dominated for about 10 years afterwards. You had two hits from this guy, Be My Love and Because. He's got a plaque of his own <laughs> and a mural of his own. You also had two, this is the same year as Lonzo was Four guys from South Philly High, the Four Aces. They had two big hits that year. 1952, four more top 20 hits just out of Philly guys. Al Martino, he's the new guy now. Two more from the Four Aces. Two from Don Cornell, Luigi Valano. He's not from South Philly, though. But. <laughs> now we're getting into, you know, Richard mentioned, and I've been asked to kind of tie in some of my personal connections and... The last three I mentioned are all people I had the fortune of working with many years later. That's Don Cornell. That's me, the kid with the red glasses on in the back. <laughs> He's probably in his 60s there. That's us with the four aces many years later. And there I am with Al Martino. That's his other friend, but <laughs> I don't know how that got in there. But um, 52 and 53, Tony Bennett, Dean Martin, now, and plus Sinatra coming back as a superstar for the second time. Tony Bennett, Dean Martin. 1954, Louis Prima. Now, we mentioned him earlier as a 
really cutting edge trumpeter in New Orleans and composer of jazz. But now he reinvents himself. Gilly Smith, the whole lounge act thing, recordings, big, big superstar, 1954. And on that note, I should mention, by now, they're so strong, they could pre pretty much do no wrong. They started actually doing Italian songs, and Americans ate it up. I mean, Prima did Way Mari, I Want to Be Americano. Al Martino did I Have But One Heart, Piccino Mare, Non Dimenticar, Damone had You're Breaking My Heart, Piso Madonata. I mean, I mean, real hardcore Italian folk songs being sold as pop music and uh, pretty incredible. Harry Warren, Salvatore Goraidna came back and wrote That's Amore for, for D. Martin. So. That's Harry Warren with one of his 11 Oscars for best song, if you could imagine. This is 1957, and if fair to remember, was his composition. The hit was sung by Vic Damone, another Italian-American. So that same year, Bobby Darin becomes a sensation. So if it sounds exhausting, it's because it was. I mean, it, you, know, you couldn't make it up. And with early rock and roll, the, the streak pretty much continued. Uh, in 1957, this is Charlie Gracie, guitar player from South Philly actually from two blocks from where I grew up. Um, he was a major influential guitar player. And um, he had two big hits in 1957, Fabulous and Butterfly. And Butterfly knocked Elvis off the charts. And Elvis, what song did he knock off the charts? There's No Tomorrow. You remember that melody? Da, 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 da. Oh, Sole Mio. So even Elvis was covering Italian songs. <laughs> But uh, Charlie was extremely influential and very big in the UK. And um, in fact, Paul McCartney's biography talks about him as an inspiration. Paul McCartney covered the song uh, Fabulous. Van Morrison took him on the road in the 90s because of his admiration for him. And when Charlie passed away, Graham Nash tweeted that his sister still had a cigarette that Charlie dropped at a 1958 show. <laughs> and that when he grew up, all she wanted him to do was be like Charlie Gracie. And we're gonna see a little bit of him. But it does continue. Connie Francis, finally a gal in 1958. Two new heartthrobs, Frankie Avalon, Fabian, 1959. Major hits. Then a major, major explosion, Bobby Rydell in 1960. He was 18, they pulled him out of Bishop Newman High School, my alma mater, and he had Wild One, a big hit. He covered um, Volare and it beat Dean Martin's version out. And then they took him to Hollywood to make uh, Bye Bye Birdie. So Bobby doesn't have a marker yet, but he does have a street name. <laughs> he was originally a drummer in South Philly. Uh, this is an old picture I found with Bobby there on the right. And his friend Pat Azaro was the guitar player. Pat changed his name to Pat Martino. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't, I mean, this was kind of wrapping up now the 20 years of domination of Italian American singers. But I should segue to the fact that there was also so many contemporary jazz figures out of, out of South Philly, Italian American community. And Pat Martino is certainly way up there. Um, he really was the extension of Eddie Lang. He continued the legacy of Eddie Lang uh, as far as jazz guitar playing. And um, his 1967, I believe, El Hombre album was, it still looked at as like this groundbreaking jazz guitar uh, record. Another uh, South Philly Italian uh, and a dear friend is Joey DeFrancesco. He was Italian, but I think his DNA would show he's from another planet because <laughs> he was just unbelievable. A child prodigy. He was playing when he was 12 years old. He, he couldn't even read. This was jazz organ, by the way. Um, couldn't reach the pedals with his feet. He was so little. But just absolutely incredible. And he was discovered by Miles Davis when he was 17 and toured with Miles. A year later, he took him on the road and went on to really historic level of... of uh, notoriety in jazz. So, you know, as I mentioned, I had the good fortune to work with some of these guys, so I'm going to kind of close, and then we could talk about questions or your own stories. Uh, this is a little longer. It's about six minutes, but we're going to highlight Charlie Gracie, Bobby Rydell, and Joey DeFrancesco, three 
uh, good friends. That's the mural of all these guys that exist on Broad Street. Um, but I thought this would give you a little bit of what they could do, their magic and their staying power, and kind of is representative of the whole topic we've been on all night. Uh, you'll see Charlie with, on the Ed Sullivan Show, uh, 1958, and then 60 years later with our band with City Rhythm. You'll see Bobby on Perry Como and Jack Benny Show, same time, 1960, and we're going to jump 60 years to him with us. And then finally, Joey, I actually found the video of the time, the moment when Miles discovered him. It was a little local TV show, and I found Joey speaking about it, so I included that. Um, it was supposed to be a showcase of young trumpet players. So if you're not a jazz fan, Miles was the penultimate jazz trumpeter. And he was supposed to be there to critique and listen to these trumpets. And all he kept doing was looking at Joey going like this. And you'll see it on there. And he interrupts the guy to find out who he is. And then, like, six months later, he's on the road in Europe with Miles. And then you'll also see Joey with us as well. So let's take a look.
As, as you saw, the um, we lost all three of them last year in 2022. I did have a uh, let's see. If this, this is all the names you could take a look at with their real names that we talked about, and some I didn't get to. Well, it's just the Art Deco font at the end there to bring us back to the beginning. Well, anyway, I appreciate you all being here. I want to mention, as I alluded to, I did a lot of the Googling around and checking stories and looking through books because a lot of these things were just in my head over the years. And I found amazing other, like, we're not the first people to come up with this. Smithsonian Institute had an article, essentially in this, a century in the spotlight. Italian Americans came of age, blah, 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 and it says, created a musical legacy that endures through the decades. Library of Congress had an article, Italian American Song. Italian American singer symbolizes romance, tradition, and the magic of love, touching the hearts of every generation. Now, these are unbiased opinions. <laughs> Wall Street Journal had one about Elvis. It was called, When Italians Ruled the Airwaves. And it said, 
of course he wanted to be Italian. When he was growing up, being a pop star usually meant being Italian. So, And uh, finally, I do want to say one other thing that I really didn't talk about that many of us know, and our parents and so forth, that not only was there the influence in the music industry, but the pride that they brought to Italian Americans, especially Italian American men, at a time, you know, every immigrant group had their challenges, and Italians certainly did. And at that time, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, there were not necessarily a lot of Italian American heroes, except maybe Joe DiMaggio or something. And so the singers were really the thing, and we all could relate to that, I'm sure. Probably many of you have a dad who idolized somebody uh, of, of, among those guys. So it's an interesting part. And maybe you have a story or a question. Be happy to chat for a couple more minutes if anybody has anything. A little more on the uh, strike, Pete, 1943, uh, Frank Sinatra. Those um, vocal groups um, mimicked instruments. Exactly. Thing. Yes. Yeah, so... All those recordings. You have them, yeah, exactly. So, and that probably led the way to the doo-wop and all of that. Yeah. It was out of necessity. It had no band, so the singer would be there, and they would be ooh-ah and this and that in the background to, to mimic a band, exactly. It really was a significant uh, part of why the big band era uh, faded away. You, know. you, you left out one famous in South Philadelphia, Billy Ruth. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Billy Ruth is uh, Lisa's brother-in-law. Great, great singer. I mean, there were so many great people. And as Richard said to like a band like mine, not world famous, obviously, but people like Billy and our group and others keep that spirit alive and Billy we lost unfortunately a few years ago but um, I think it is important you know it's certainly out there all these styles of music and I included some of the rock stars in there for you to see as well so it'll continue forever but I think we were kind of focusing on what these guys brought to the table that kind of had an impact universally in, in that kind of music you talk a lot about like the Philadelphia contribution here and it seemed to be City was such a hub for musical talent through like the Gamble and Huff, oh, sure. not Philadelphia area. So, why do you think there's that sort of movement left the city? Why do you think there's such a, a dirt? Why it's not here now? <laughs> we need a sociology professor for that, I think. But it's funny you mentioned Gamble and Huff. Yeah, Richard could probably lecture you on that one. But no, I think there is still a lot of music making that's going on. And I may not be the judge of that, but. Uh, I should mention, you mentioned Gamble and Huff. Uh, again, fun fact, Cameo, uh, Cameo Records out of Philadelphia was, their biggest star was when they signed Charlie Gracie, his first hit, and then Bobby Rydell. And guess who bought Cameo Records in the 70s? Philadelphia International Records, Gamble and Huff. So that legacy continued. They just literally tore down the studio a few years ago. All kinds of... Useless information tonight. <laughs> you think the internet and the digital revolution really changed, and you think it's going to be different in the future? Will this continue? Will music continue? What do you? What do you well, think? I think if anything, it's more accessible. I mean, we looked at. You could kind of relate to what we said earlier, right? From nothing, two thousand thousands of years of no recording to to these cylinder things, right? You went from that to this to this, to radio. I mean, we didn't even get into television and uh, cassette tapes and VHS and CDs. That's all gone now, too. The CD went the way of the cylinder already. <laughs> that didn't take long. So I think, if anything, the Internet and Spotify and things like that make music even more accessible. I guess it's up to us to let people know to try and go check it out, you know. I have a silly question. What is the difference between a band and an orchestra? You know, this is a subject. Yeah, there's no real difference. <laughs> when we started out, we called it the City Rhythm Orchestra. I don't know, Nick, why did we do that? I don't even know. <laughs> but, um, I mean, traditionally, of course, you think of a symphony orchestra, but uh, people like Paul Whiteman was an orchestra. Well, again, it, yeah. they called them hot bands because they were, you know, that fancy, fast jazz, but they had strings. They could play Rhapsody in Blue was Paul Whiteman orchestra. So uh, it's a real fine line, and you'll see that 
with pop groups today. They'll may call themselves a band or I mean, technically an orchestra has strings and a band doesn't, but back in the day, like Sousa was a band, right? It was a marching band and the Philadelphia Orchestra was an orchestra. It was very clearly defined then. Now it's a lot more blurred. Before Sousa, the guys Absolutely, yes. So Rich was asking about the whole idea, the marching bands, and those of you that know our, uh, the, the parish that Richard alluded to in South Philly, we still maintain that, uh, the processions with the old Italian marching band music. So yes, that predates Sousa. I wasn't going to take credit for him, but now you reminded me. <laughs> There's a great moment in the music band when uh, Professor Hill says the great the he mentions. He wants to be like the great. One of the yes, one of the, exactly. Yeah. Or something. Yes, an Italian, right. So YouTube. Well, a lot of the Italian, they came over here as well. They did travel here, the Italian marching bands, yeah. yeah. Again, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you coming out tonight. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned a little bit. And thanks again for having me very much. Appreciate it.